approach from here. Um, as, we, as we've done in the past two weeks with our speakers, if you have a question, please feel free to type it into the chat. I will be monitoring uh, the chat this evening. And when we get to the Q&A segment of our time together, then I will uh, look through the questions in the chat and may ask some of you to unmute to ask your questions. So from there, I'm, I'm running the technology tonight and feeling the questions and Liz is uh, going to introduce our speaker. Uh, be before you start. Oh, yes, Sandra. Uh, I'm getting um, ding, ding, ding sounds. And I don't know what they're from. That is the sound. Of yeah, Ann, can you turn off the, the doorbell? Yeah, it's a little doorbell, but Ann will mute. It's the sound of people coming into this hall, <laughs> Sandra. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the sound of everybody very excited to see you. <laughs> oh, I, I thought I was doing something wrong. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. So um, we might hear that a few more minutes while people come in. But I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, good evening, everybody. Happy All Souls Day. Hello. And, uh, happy Election Eve. I cannot tell you how happy I am to be with all of you tonight in particular and how happy I am that our guest Sandra is here, Sandra Schneiders. So we usually begin with an opening prayer and we will do that tonight, but I want to actually first say something about our guest because it will give you some context for uh, the song that I'm going to play, which is our opening prayer. So I kind of have goosebumps that I'm um, introducing Sandra Schneiders. Um, she is sister of the Servants of the Immaculate Heart, an IHM sister out of Michigan. And she has taught for so many years, the past 40 plus years at the Jesuit School of Theology. She has published so many works in biblical hermeneutics which is that fancy word for interpretation, biblical spirituality, feminism, theology. She has won so many awards, so many awards, including the John Kurt Courtney Murray Award, the Eves Congoer Award, the Monica Hellwerk Award, and the highest award of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, and a lot more awards as well. She has even had a book of essays published in her honor. Um, and Sandra has um, at least two very important ties to Holy Trinity, which David pointed out in our morning prayer this morning. Uh, many of you knew and loved uh, Anne, Sandra's sister, Anne, who was a Holy Trinity parishioner and an acolyte at the 1130 Mass for many years. So it's very appropriate that on All Souls, Sandra is here, and we remember maybe just this is in honor of your sister, um, Anne. Second, Ty, if you appreciate any of the biblical exegesis of the preaching in any of your favorite Jesuits sermons, if there's a very good chance that uh, you have Sandra to thank because she taught these very Jesuits, as I said, for over 40 years, including our pastor, uh, Kevin Gillespie. So I cannot overstate the impact that Sandra Schneiders has had, including uh, for me. So I, uh, my dissertation was called Lives as Revelatory Texts and I borrowed that from Sandra Schneider's book, Revelatory, The Revelatory Text, Interpreting the New Testament. So uh, a couple of years ago at the American Academy of Religion, it was a special milestone birthday for Sandra her 80th birthday, and there were many events in her honor, including a panel um, and a reception at which one of her former students sang a song that she composed in Sandra's honor, inspired by an imaginative reading of the Gospel of John and um, the story of the woman at the well. Sandra's, um, one of her great gifts is her wisdom about the Gospel of John. And uh, this notion that the text is revelatory is that there's a narrative and then there's what we bring to it and how 
the narrative speaks to us. So I want to open us before we hear from Sandra with a beautiful song that was, as I said, composed in Sandra's honor. And uh, it's based on John 4, and I forget the exact verses, but it's the woman at the well. And we're gonna try to um, put the words up for you and also um, have you hear the music. So I'm gonna go on mute and Anne's gonna... No, she went on mute. We are already on mute. Good. No, we're not. Yeah, we are. You were. Did you take us off? We're having a slight technical difficulty, but bear with us. We're going to try this again. And then you'll have to go off mute. And you're on mute still. you right back you were tired it was the sixth hour the time and the place for eternity life to make sense the right kind of space for a scene what is she doing here rabbi you've got to eat how dare you speak to me how dare you cross the line that was drawn and still drawn give me something to drink i am tired it is the sixth hour cause i am that you are mm, I am shameless faceless if only you knew you have no bucket she cut through the small talk and called you to honor an overdue covenant one of those conversations that mark a world one of those rare occasions where time stands still And the truth that was claimed as their two worlds collide and change shape Is she's more than a match for your mind She can find her way through all the clues to your truth and your power For now is the hour of I am You are Nameless claim Believe me that you are mm, I am Shameless, faceless if Only you knew it Only you knew it Only you knew it
I'm sorry you couldn't see the words. We'll send them out later. So it is my absolute privilege to introduce you to Sandra Schneiders. And um, if we're going to talk, we're going to have a conversation and then open it for questions. But first, Sandra, um, can you talk to us a little bit about that song and what's behind it? Or even just how you felt hearing that again. Every time I hear it, it, uh, it goes deeper. Um, I have no idea what was behind it. Um, <laughs> I was as surprised as anybody else when it um, was sung the first time at the celebration. Uh, but I, I think it's a, at the very least, it's a meditation on the great ego AB that, that gets spoken for the first time um, in John's gospel to the woman who is supposed to be uh, a sinner, who's supposed to be outside the sphere of grace and the revelation to her that, that Jesus makes, that he is. And so that play between ego and me, the, you know, the, uh, the Latin for the, for the Hebrew expression of God to Moses, at, uh, when God, makes the first great revelation uh, to the chosen people. So here's this woman who is a supposedly an outsider, a heretic and so on. So the play on mutual self-disclosure, mutual self-revelation, mutual recognition uh, and where that takes place in outside the boundaries of the, the promised land, if you will, uh, to a heretic at the very best and somewhat of questionable reputation. So it's, I, I think it's a meditation on the gratuity of, of salvation and the, the non-discriminative, <laughs> non-discriminatory, um, uh, that people aren't being measured by how virtuous they are and whether they belong to the right tribe and whether they acquitted themselves well. Uh, but that this woman calls forth the first great revelation of the great I am in the person of Jesus. So I, I think you just have to listen to it over and over and uh, let it play you instead of you playing it. <laughs> That's the idea of the revelatory text, right? That dynamic conversation. Yeah. Where can people read a little more about your, your interpretation, your uh, biblical hermeneutics in the Gospel of John. Is that in the book, the revelatory text, or one of your other dozen books? Uh, I would say, uh, you know, for an actual interpretation of the passage, a written that you may believe is a collection of essays on different passages in John's Gospel. Uh, and it's probably more accessible to people than the revelatory text because the revelatory text uh, presumes a certain uh, level of theological education, uh, but like if you were, wanted to use something uh, with in a pastoral situation, for example, or a homily, something like that, I would definitely suggest starting with um, written that you may believe. And if your topic is the resurrection, then uh, Jesus risen in our midst. So th those would be two other books. That, uh, the revelatory text is actually a, a text in hermeneutics. So it, it's written for students. Um, uh, so, so yeah, yes, uh, I was one of those students who read it and um, it had great impact on me. But speaking of a, a certain level of theological education, let's go back uh, some, <laughs> what, I don't know how many years, uh, 50, 60, uh, what year did you join the Immaculate Heart of Mary? Uh, 1958. 1958. So um, somewhere I saw that for a number of years you taught 
uh, elementary school and high school and some at Mary Grove for maybe 15 or so years before your uh, greater theological education. And so I am wondering, how did it come about that after teaching in those contexts, you went on for more studies? Well, I, I was uh, born in, in the period of the church that will probably go down in history as one of the most transformative, really, in the whole history of the church. And that is the run-up to Vatican II. Uh, when the church had reached probably its most sclerotic state, uh, in, at, at least in any history that we're going to look back on. Uh, Wait, can you tell me what does that word mean? I well, don't know that word. <laughs> um, you know what sclerosis is, you know, when everything, everything is um, stiff and stuck and, um, okay. you know, uh, and it was into that context that John the 23rd introduced the explosive idea of an ecumenical council, which we hadn't had for in the lifetime of anybody who was around. Um, and the run up to the council uh, was probably unlike that for any council and as it wasn't called to squelch a particular heresy or to, um, Launch some particular uh, project. It was uh, it was really a council of renewal. The the brilliant insight of John the twenty third that the moment of sclerosis should be seized as the time to call the church to resurrection. And and so the huge amount of preparation, theological preparation, the very best uh, minds in the church were pressed into service to um, prepare. And all the time that it was being prepared, of course, we were living for the first time in a world where instant communication or nearly instant communication made all of this very available to all kinds of people. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was born in, into an extremely fortuitous uh, historical climate. Um, and at that time, we happened to have a very uh, visionary uh, leader. Uh, when you were talking with Carolyn Osick, she mentioned uh, having a teacher, Catherine Sullivan, the first woman to get a doctorate in biblical studies as, as her teacher. And uh, we had a similar extraordinary um, religious in our congregation who was the assistant novice mistress when I was a novice. So she was teaching us. And she also was one of the very few women uh, in the church at that point to have a doctorate in theology from St. Mary's uh, uh, Notre Dame. Uh, and she taught us scripture. And so uh, I, uh, her love for scripture was uh, absolutely contagious. Uh, it didn't apparently, the contagion apparently did not affect everybody in my class, <laughs> but, but I was singularly uh, susceptible to that disease. And, uh, and then it, as it happened, I went through and not exactly the, the most normal course of, uh, of, of formation. Uh, I went out on mission for the first time when I was still a second year novice, uh, and that was unusual. And I wasn't in... Uh, the formation, that, that was when the, the sister formation movement was at its height with the idea that sisters should be prepared, uh, fully prepared professionally before they went out to teach, whether it was grade school or high school or what. Uh, and so uh, all of my class were kept at the mother house for two years after profession in order to finish their college uh, education. Uh, I was sent to our college, so not at the mother house, um, to finish my uh, college, and then I was then I was sent to um, get a master's in philosophy. Uh, we were never consulted about these things; <laughs> we, we just kind of moved around. But I was ecstatic because I was uh, had been fussing around with philosophy since grade school, probably. Um, so I was delighted uh, 
it was not at all a, a burdensome thing. Uh, so I finished, uh, I got my MA in philosophy. Uh, and in the meantime, this very charismatic uh, scripture teacher and novice mistress that we had had uh, was elected general superior. And she decided, so this was right after the council, that there should be uh, a, a, a significant core of women religious who would have uh, doctoral degrees in theology. In other words, that we would stop having to bring in father to teach all of our members and thereby limiting them to whatever father happened to know. Yeah. Uh, so she, she thought we needed to have women with doctoral degrees in theology. And so she sent about eight or nine of us uh, on to study. Uh, and she left it up to us to uh, investigate and make suggestions about where we would go and what we would study. And I, I picked Paris, uh, the Institut Catholique in Paris, uh, which was, the faculty was largely Pariti at the Second Vatican Council. Uh -huh. who were just back from the council. <laughs> um, was and, one of those Yves Congor, was he French? Yes, yes, uh, Chenou, um, uh, Danielou, um, more of uh, a The one who uh, impressed me the most was Lee Cogne, who was uh, probably the world's most accomplished student of spirituality, which was not a mainstream uh, specialization at that point. And I, I had him for class. He was to be my thesis director uh, and had a heart attack oh. the, the year that I would have been writing it. So that didn't work out too well. But um, so anyway, uh, so we went off. Uh, the others went pretty much to Louvain uh, I, I went to Paris, uh, and then after I finished my licentiate, which was is like a it's like an advanced master's. Um, instead of staying in Paris for the doctorate, I decided to go to uh, Rome uh, because of the fact that it had an institute of spirituality, okay. the, the first in uh, in the modern uh, academy. Um, and uh, also there was the Biblicum, which was the pontifical faculty for the study of scripture. So my two loves, scripture and spirituality, were literally on two sides of the same block <laughs> in the middle of Rome. Uh, and the institution in which I was enrolled was the Gregorian, with, to which both of them, of which both of them were faculties. Uh, so I had theology, uh, spirituality and biblical studies on three sides of the square <laughs> where I was um, studying. Uh, and, and I happened to uh, fall into the hands of a, uh, a Jesuit on the faculty of the Greg and on the faculty of the uh, Institute of Spirituality who was himself uh, getting his doctorate in biblical studies. So the three, uh, the convergence of these interests was from the very beginning of my studies. Um, you were the one, you were uh, one of the first two women to receive a, an advanced degree, a doctorate from a pontifical institute, right? And did you find, were you, uh, you had these colleagues who influenced your direction and your studies. Did you find any barriers um, or <laughs> being a woman in this context. <laughs> I guess. Uh, there were barriers everywhere. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the people there, uh, you know, simply had no other experience. Mm -hmm. You know, they, it just wasn't. Now, one good thing about Europe, and that was true in Paris at the Institut Catholique as well as in Rome. Uh, universities, if they were going to be accredited by the state, by the, by the country, the government, uh, were not free to discriminate against um, 
women matriculating in those faculties. Mm -hmm. So they really didn't have the choice to have only men. Now, some Catholic faculties managed it by having a program that was only for ordination candidates. So they could say, uh, you know, we're excluding anybody who can't be a, a, a candidate for ordination. Uh, but that was already beginning to break down even way back then, uh, where an institution's reputation uh, depended on it staying up to speed with, you know, with what was considered to be the way educational institutions should function. So there was, uh, now that didn't stop the internal uh, discrimination of, of all sorts, deliberate and indeliberate, but um, at least you, a, a woman could get in the door uh, in a way that they, that for example, if I had been in the United States and had wanted to attend the major seminary, I couldn't have done it. But you mentioned uh, spirituality as that an academic subject, both in Paris and then in Rome. And I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about what that means to have an academic study of spirituality and how does that connect with the lived spirituality that we are all pursuing? Uh, well, um, the division of theology, the whole field of theology, and even giving it that name, theology, um, which goes all the way back to the, to the Middle Ages, uh, the process or the progress of the field of theology or discourse about God, that's what theology means, discourse about God, thinking, talking, studying, writing about God. Uh, and that was a much more holistic enterprise in the early church of the patristic period and up through the Middle Ages and so on. Uh, but it got more and more divided as we got closer and closer uh, and through the Enlightenment and so on. Uh, so theology began to be considered to be systematic theology and moral theology primarily uh, with little diddly dads here and there. Um, so spirituality, which originally was the whole matrix of theology, if you go back to the patristic era, they wouldn't have really thought it was worth studying anything that didn't that wasn't rooted in religious experience and leading to religious experience. Mm -hmm. In other words, spirituality was the the matrix of the whole theological enterprise. And as we go through the Middle Ages, and especially into uh, the Enlightenment and the, the scientific revolution, the Enlightenment, and so on, you had more and more um, uh, cutting up of the intellectual project both in the secular sphere and in the religious sphere, uh, so that you had more and more subdivisions. You had dogmatic theology, immoral theology, and then you had subdivisions, ecclesiology, theology of the church, Christology, theology of Jesus, um, Trinitarian theology, and so on. Uh, and in the process of scientizing, if you will, theology in, in um, sync with what was going on in secular disciplines, uh, spirituality got kind of siphoned out of all of them and it became a little cottage industry over here that was mainly concerned with piety. Hmm. So you really couldn't study it. I mean, how do you study somebody's piety? Uh, however, that didn't stop the church from being spiritual, of course. Uh, and a tremendous body of uh, very important literature. Uh, for example, the mystical writings of, uh, of Teresa of Avila or John of the Cross, or uh, I mean, there's a whole body from the, from the early fathers of the church, from uh, Origen through Augustine in the Middle Ages. Thomas Aquinas was, uh, uh, his writings are highly, uh, suffused with spirituality. So uh, so there's a whole huge body of, of stuff to study, but that was not considered spirituality. Spirituality was saying the rosary every day, you know, how many um, 
can't believe we use the term all the time. How many ejaculations could you make a day? <laughs> you know, saying, my Jesus, mercy, my Jesus, mercy, my Jesus, mercy, 500,000 times, and that would get you into heaven. Um, and it was um, uh, um, felt religious devotion and so on. So it ceased to be a um, legitimate area of theological work. Even though there was a huge body of material that was extremely serious. I mean, anybody who's tried to read Trees of Avila, you don't have to um, wonder about the, the intellectual prowess that was required to write that. And the same with many, many, uh, I mean, starting with Augustine and not starting with them, but passing by way of Augustine. Uh, so spirituality became a kind of, uh, you know, kindergarten operation. And then you had serious theology, systematic theology, moral theology, and the subdivisions of systematics, Christology, ecclesiology, and so on. So that was theology. And then you had spirituality over here for the kiddies. Um, and biblical studies in the Catholic experience, unfortunately, part of it being uh, tied up with the Reformation and reaction against it and so on, uh, biblical studies uh, got reduced, I don't want to say entirely, but largely to being a kind of arsenal of proof texts to bolster up the arguments for things that were going on in systematic theology. So after you got the argument built by means of philosophy, and particularly Thomistic philosophy coming out of the Aristotelian, not out of the Platonic tradition, uh, then you had to show that there was some basis for this in scripture. And so texts got pulled out, out of context, but, but also um, out of their original function, their original purpose. And they became proof texts, what we call proof texts. So they were, uh, after you figured out what God really meant, then you said, oh, and incidentally, you can find the proof that God thought of this by referring to this text. So biblical studies became a kind of um, handmaid, if you will, of uh, theology. And spirituality was the pablum that distilled out of systematic theology for people who weren't capable of theology. Uh, and so, you know, everybody should be involved in piety, but you could only, you could only be involved in theology if you really had a brain. And by definition, that excluded women. Okay, mm. so, uh, what, what happened with Vatican II was it really, uh, the germ of it was really the so-called return to the sources. And the sources were not Thomas Aquinas, Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, and so on. The sources were scripture. So for the first time in hundreds and hundreds of years, the, the whole idea of the reform was that it would be rooted in and it would grow out of and it would be a response to scripture. Well, so we needed a whole new theology of scripture. We needed a whole new approach to exegesis. We had to go back, somebody had to go back and learn the original languages so they could read the real texts. Uh, and so we had a, a, a terrific explosion of interest in scripture. Um, and I, Sandra, yeah. I think I see you as one of those um, in the forefront really of bringing all of those disciplines back together, you know, not so compartmentalized the biblical spirituality, the study of spirituality and being a theologian as well. Um, and I'm wondering in, in your scholarship, I know this is a probably a hard question to answer for all the many years you've done it, but is there a gem that you, uh, that was revealed, a revelatory gem in your scholarship that has helped you uh, stay in the work and stay in the church, <laughs> since we're the women, women and men who stay. <laughs> Any wisdom from your scholarship that's helped you? Um, I, well, of course, you know, I mean, if you're really involved in it, doctoral studies in, in theology with, with really good people, every day is a revelation. It's, mm. uh, uh, I can't understand why anybody who has the opportunity doesn't study theology. <laughs> Some of my students could probably tell you why, but um, 
uh, for me, it, it really did develop very organically. Uh, it was really my first introduction to scripture that, uh, especially to the New Testament and particularly to the Gospel of John, uh, that attracted me to the whole field. But I was interested in it. I, you don't enter the convent if you don't have some interest in religion. Uh, <laughs> and my interest was not primarily ministry in the sense that I wanted to be a, a a teacher or a nurse or a, so it wasn't as as was the case for uh, some women who really had two choices as Catholic young women when they graduated from high school they could get married or go into the convent or be an old maid and the third was not desirable by anybody so the rest were split between uh, you know uh, that wasn't my uh, um, experience at all. Uh, I was fascinated by religion from the time that I was a kid. Uh, it, you know, when I, when I found out any question you asked, if you followed it far enough, the answer was God. Uh, you know, that's what I wanted to deal with or, you know, have my life be about. Uh, so I was kind of in my element in, uh, in religion. Uh, so uh, let's see, your original question for this was what, how, how did I get into a simultaneously all these different fields? Well, in my experience, both of um, study and of teaching and writing after, after my formal studies, my experience of it was that it was all one thing. I was very enamored of scripture and I know now that it's because of my love of literature. I, I mean, there's all the difference in the world between reading a theology textbook and reading scripture. Uh, I mean, scripture is poetry, it's, it's prose, it's, uh, it's drama, it's, um, uh, you enter into the biblical text, you don't dissect it in order to get the, the truth out of it. You enter into it and allow it to play you rather than you dissecting it. Yes. Uh, so, uh, and, and that's where um, my interest in hermeneutics came in, because what I realized was that the, these texts, these biblical texts could not be read as quasi-theological textbooks. So something like the story of the Samaritan woman, it, it simply can't be dissected. And you get to the end and say, this is what it means. Mm -hmm. You could read it 500 times and you won't know what it means. And you will always know more what it means. So, and I realized, I, I, I found out that the academic discipline, which specialized in this issue of interpretation was called hermeneutics. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, immediately drawn into hermeneutics as the primary approach to the Bible as text. And once I began to find out what the Bible was talking about, clearly it was spirituality. Yeah. I mean, that spirituality produced it and it produces spirituality. And that of course then, once you get into it with all of our historical and scientific and psychological and sociological and so on, where we are as 20, at that point, 20th century, 21st century uh, people, uh, then you realize that you that theology has to come in to and be used to organize that experience-based data in a way that it can be used to make progress in understanding God rather than simply to be immersed in God, which is plenty. But um, but if we want to communicate this to other people, then we have to find a um, quasi-scientific um, way to do it. In other words, you have to find an orderly way to do it. So you can't talk simultaneously about Christology and ecclesiology and moral theology and so on. You, so you divide them up into, into separate spheres and you, you study them individually. Uh, and so you end up with uh, organized theology. So the whole process, it wasn't something that I figured out ahead of time and then set out to do. 
I got plunged into it and began to see how these things went together and why you couldn't really do one of them. Now people do. Somebody says, I'm a moral theologian, don't ask me about the Trinity. Well, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, then you don't know moral theology. <laughs> Or the person who says, you know, I'm into Christology, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm, you know, missiology is not my bag. Um, I, I think that's to miss the point. I mean, theology is not a, a collection of separate expertises, and you pick one and specialize and get good at it and let the rest of them go. Yeah. No, but which key, ones come key. together in any given person, any given theologian? So what came together in Bernard Herring, for example, came together through the prism of moral theology. He was deeply, deeply, deeply concerned with the way in which the conscience of people had been religiously abused. And he was seeking a way to liberate the moral subjectivity of believers. Hmm. But that led him into scripture and systematic theology and Christology and, and all the rest of it. I came in through the door of scripture. Uh, Karl Rahner came in through the door of systematic theology. But what we began to see in this period after the council is this is one project and different people. So it's like medicine, maybe one science, but you have people who specialize in the brain and people who specialize in the heart and so on, but they have to work together. You can't say, you know, I'm gonna work on your heart. I don't care what happens to your brain. Well, that's a great holistic approach. And I, I think you're, you're an important reason that, that I think people are seeing theology in that more holistic way. Uh, I would love to um, talk to you all night. I wanna give other people an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, and so uh, as we're talking, Anne will, um, call upon people to ask I, a question. Sure, or, or some, of, some of the questions are coming directly to me. So one, one question, Sandra, is if, if you were to put together a curriculum for a course on spirituality today, what would you want to see in that, that course? What, what would be on your syllabus? Oh, well, uh, I've had to do this many times. Uh, it would depend <laughs> on who the people are. For example, are they all Christian or are they all in some branch of Christianity? And if they aren't, then you're gonna take an interreligious approach to it. Uh, what level of um, theological education do they have? Are they, or, or education period? So are they college graduates uh, or are they uh, people without a college education, a parish group, for example, that includes a number of people who have uh, not really been exposed to, uh, or is it a group of seminarians? Uh, now, the, the program that I've had the most experience with is the one that we built at the Graduate Theological Union, which was a doctoral program in Christian spirituality. So, uh, so what got included in that, uh, students had to um, do um, oral examinations uh, in five different areas. So they had, to, uh, they had to work in the area of theology, uh, uh, history, the history of spirituality. Um, they had to study one non-Christian spirituality and not comparatively like you know, which is better. They had to actually enter into the spirituality of a non-Christian faith uh, in order to see, experience the dynamics of spirituality outside the Christian tradition. Um, they had to do history, theology. Uh, oh, and they also had to do some experiential project. Uh, so it might be in the area of Christian spirit, um, um, social justice ministry, or it might be in the area of uh, feminist experience or something where they did some hands-on uh, work with the spirituality of real living human beings uh, to see 
how religious questions arise, how spirituality develops and so on. Uh, so they had to do that at the comprehensive level before they went on to the dissertation level. So that's, that's where I got involved in, you know, what should go into the education of a person who's going to specialize in spirituality. Thank you. Someone else at, mentioned your book, New Wine, New Wineskins. Mm -hmm. uh, and wondering what are the new wineskins for today? Well, that, that book was uh, the first volume of my trilogy on the theology and spirituality of uh, Catholic religious life. Uh, so the old wineskins, uh, obviously the, it's taken from the biblical text. It, you don't put new wine in old wineskins or the wineskins burst and you lose the wine and the skins at the same time. Uh, so it was written about the uh, renewal that women's religious congregations in particular were undergoing in the aftermath of the council. And, uh, and saying, you know, it's not simply a matter of uh, patching a few things up, that we really had to kind of go back to the drawing boards, uh, biblical, theological, pastoral, and so on, uh, and see what the, 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 what the, the life as a container of an individual's life uh, should be today. Uh, so that's really where that came from. So I was looking at the interpretation of the vows, uh, the understanding of vocation, uh, notions of perseverance, um, uh, the integralness of ministry to religious life, the role of prayer and so on. So I was re-looking at religious life from a post-conciliar perspective and fundamentally a biblical perspective. So Liz, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, well, I wanted to ask, um, Sandra, you taught um, Jesuit seminarians for 43, 44 years. Um, you're still emerita at the Jesuit Theological Union, so, or School of Theology. Uh, when did you start calling yourself a feminist theologian, and how has that been received by your many, your, your generations of students? <laughs> Donald, you know, is, is one of my students here? Did you say? <laughs> you should ask him. <laughs> well, actually, I see his name. Kevin, are you on? I'd love to hear your experience of being taught by Sandra. If you well, it, uh, very inspiring, and it's a privilege to be with Sandra again. Um, to think to think beyond one's gender, to think beyond the critical questions and how to ask a question. And as Sandra was talking about scriptural hermeneutics, the different ways texts could be interpreted. And to open the, you open our eyes to see, do you see the bias? Do you see the prejudice? Do you see the hidden voices of women, such as the woman, woman at the well? So I don't want to say too much longer because it's Sandra's uh, uh, presentation. But just so you know, my colleagues and I, men and women uh, at Berkeley were really inspired and led in a critical consciousness. The questions weren't always easy and it wasn't just academics, it was a lifestyle and embodiment. So uh, Sandra really did influence a generation of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, no matter where I go, there are, if there are Jesuits around anywhere, some of my former students, <laughs> I was at the Jesuit Curia in Rome not too long ago uh, with, the, uh, with Father Rupe, of happy memory. And uh, when we walked into the dining room for lunch, all the, <laughs> it was the job of whoever the person was the guest of to introduce the guest. So, uh, Father Rupe introduced me, and all of a sudden these hands started going up. Hi, Sandra. <laughs> so these were now ordained Jesuits who were working in the Curia in Rome, uh, who were in the dining room. <laughs> and I thought, no matter where I go, when I went to the Philippines, my students were there. Uh, so uh, it, it's a long time to teach at one institution. I never set out to teach at one institution for 45 years. Uh, but by the, and when I went there, it was basically a Jesuit scholasticate. So 96% of the students were Jesuits. 
Now that's not true today, uh, but um, so that you know we turned out a lot of people over that uh, you know amount of time. Uh, were there obstacles? Uh, you bet. <laughs> there were there were huge obstacles. Um, there were a few bad apples in the you know who who really were up to no good. But in general, the problem was uh, was not bad will. It was just a lack of any kind of categories uh, for thinking differently. When people have grown up within a system where everything is perfectly clearly correct, and then someone comes in and doesn't fit into any of the categories, you know, like being a man. I mean, that's a simple enough requirement. Uh, but here you have a critter who doesn't fit into that. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it was a, there was, a, there were a lot of very difficult aspects of breaking open a system which had been in place for over 500 years, without question, uh, and for it to make room for um, yeah, one, one wonderful gentleman, a Spanish Jesuit who but no one would put down as in any way nasty or, or anything. Uh, I was told this by the person he talked to that after uh, final oral exams uh, for his class, that he was simply, he was still stunned by the time he got to the evening events by the fact that a woman had passed his exam. And this wasn't because he was a nasty man or an idiot. But he just had no experience of women thinking. I had one professor say to me, dumbfounded in the middle of an oral exam, he said, you've read the textbook. And I said, yes, I, yeah, 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 yes, I, I did. I read, and it was like, you could read. And so it, a lot of it was um, not malevolent in the sense of people being deliberately nasty. It, it's as someone said, you know, it's just nobody expects Fido to be able to dance and much less to be able to sing while dancing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, what were they going to do with it? Uh, but what strikes me in hindsight is that, you know, 40 years is a relatively short time to upend something that took 1500 years to build. Right. So, uh, so Sandra, another, another question um, is, how do you think the renewal among religious women's congregations have influenced current attitudes towards women's place in church leadership? Well, I think it, it depends entirely on who you're talking to. I, I don't think anybody would deny that the renewal of in women's religious congregations probably proceeded more rapidly than in any other sector of the church. Um, and the therefore the perception of women in general uh, and particularly uh, women religious uh, has changed enormously. Now, some people are delighted about that and some other people are anything but delighted about it. But, you know, I, I'm not sure what direction your question was taking. Uh, you know, like where you want me to go with that. I, I think that um, certainly when it comes to women the most public women in the church are women religious. And they were for a long time simply because of the habit that they wore and the fact that they ran all the Catholic schools and all the Catholic hospitals and so on. That's no longer the case. Women religious are in the minority as far as numbers are concerned. But certainly we, we were the public face of the emergence of women in the church right after the council. Sandra, um, Liz again. Uh, I know you were the first non-Jesuit and the first woman who had tenure um, there at Berkeley. And I was gonna ask you what you hope the next generation of scholars will continue with, what's the unfinished business. But I've just discovered that there is a professor from your institution, Julie Rubio, who's on our Zoom call. And I'm gonna invite her to unmute because she has a question for you. Oh, Julie, where are you? 
enough scholars. I yeah, saw Lee was coming, coming up as a second Liz McCluskey because she shared her link with me. <laughs> um, but um, I'm in front of a window here in Berkeley. Um, good to see you. So I had a question for you about your book, Beyond Patching. And Julie, are you, excuse me, are you there somewhere? I or am. I, it looks like I'm Liz McCluskey. Oh, oh, there you are. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting a little spooky. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I was, I've been rereading your book, Beyond Patching. Um, the re, I, I think it was first written in the 90s and then revised in the early 2000s uh, mm -hmm. or later 2000s. And I've been thinking about, um, I won't get the wording exactly right, but you say something like the longer you're a feminist in the church, the, the deeper the tension be becomes. Um, you you, you see the problems when you're first introduced to them and then you just, you keep seeing and you see that they go all the way down. And that's, I, I think the genesis of the title beyond patching. And so I guess I'm, I'm wondering, you know, I know that those tensions must, must also wear on you um, over the years. And, and I'm just wondering, how do you see those tensions now? What does that look like for you now? Uh, well, <laughs> I suppose from one standpoint, you could say, you know, the battle's been won. I mean, no uh, faculty, theology or otherwise uh, can maintain its credibility if it excludes women completely, which is why so many seminaries are sliding down the tubes. Uh, everybody knows that the human experience cannot be either fully had or fully expressed by one gender. So, uh, On the other hand, I, I think <laughs> that um, many younger women coming up are not looking to be part of an institution that um, where they have to fight for breath all the time. They'd rather do their scholarship in a slightly more enlightened environment, uh, which could be a great loss to the church. <laughs> you know, you can you can lose the the diversity that was brought in by the presence of women, by them simply saying, you know, I don't want to devote any significant portion of my intellectual energy to dealing with a Neanderthal population. So, you know, uh, what's it, I, I don't know how it's, how it's going to fall out. I, I do know that, you know, as you do, that at the Catholic Theological Society of America, for example, an increasing number of the new members are both women and lay women. So it's, it's not just that there will be some more nuns coming along, but uh, these are people who have gone into theology because they really want to study theology. Uh, and they're really not asking permission from the, you know, the people who think they're in charge. You yourself are a good example. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that I, I don't know how you perceive it, but um, the idea that women do theology by permission of men, <clears throat> as long as they do it the way men would like to have it done, I think is simply passe. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Julie, and welcome. So, Jane, would you like to unmute and, and ask your question? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, hi, thank you for your, um, your words of wisdom tonight. I'm thrilled to hear from you. Um, uh, yeah, so I have um, three daughters who are ages 19, 21, and 23, and they see, like you're talking about, no place for themselves in an institution that won't even let them rise to a, a normal le level of leadership. And um, so as a mother, I, I feel at a loss for how to, I mean, I, I know they'll find their path, but it's, um, I just kind of wonder what you, what you say to these young students or middle-aged students like myself who, are, who maybe find a call, but know where to go with it. Um, what's, you know, from your experience, what would you suggest? Yeah, it, it's a real conundrum. Uh, you know, I, people always assume that I'm all in favor of the ordination of women. Um, and I 
am extremely ambivalent about it. Uh, as I say, you know, throwing a goldfish into a tank of sharks is not the way to convert the sharks. It's a way to lose your goldfish. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think there are some institutions that can get to the point where, um, as it were, converting them from the inside out is really not going to work. Uh, but the problem with, uh, uh, for me, the whole uh, argument over the ordination of women is extremely complex uh, because attaining the objective of having women ordained would also underwrite the presuppositions that that is a position of power. And therefore everyone should have access to it. Uh, so in other words, it would underwrite a bad theology of ordination. On the other hand, excluding people from anything that is uh, the legitimate um, uh, area of participation in whatever organization they, they belong to is um, I, I guess unjust in the first place, but in this case, it's extremely counterproductive since the ministerial gifts of women are so well proven, uh, even in comparison with, with ordained ministry, uh, that excluding them is self-defeating, it's destructive behavior, and it's also discriminatory. So it really is uh, it, the classic catch-22. And I, I don't see any, and this is my private opinion, I'm not giving you a theological opinion. My private opinion is that what has to happen is the dismantling of the system. And that it has to be rebuilt from the ground up. I mean, there are some things that simply lose their validity because of historical developments. So the way that we put people through school nowadays is very different from the way we put people through school uh, with a little red schoolhouse in the village. We just don't do it that way anymore. Uh, so I, I think the whole um, uh, understanding of ministry has to, current, theologically grounded, biblically based understanding of ministry, which is very far from being institutionalized in what we now call uh, the clerical arrangement, the hierarchical arrangement. And so at a certain point, an institution can simply become more abundant to the extent that you have to rebuild it from the ground up. So, you know, I, uh, and as I say, that's, that's my personal opinion. So people say to me like, well, you're, you don't seem to be on the bandwagon for the ordination of women. And I, I say, um, you know, it's kind of like, saying that my commitment to racial justice in this country uh, has to begin with the desegregation of grocery stores. Yeah, I mean, the, the, <laughs> the approach I think has to be more radical than, than what we're currently looking at, to put women into a situation which in so many ways is dysfunctional. And all we have to do is look at the clergy sex abuse scandal, look at the scandals in the hierarchy, look at the, uh, the appointment of, of electors and all the rest of it to say this system is so dysfunctional, which is not to say that there are not good ordained ministers who are giving their lives and doing everything possible, but the system is so dysfunctional that I don't think adding women is gonna greatly improve it. What it might do is attract the very women who would buy into that system. And so, thereby strengthen it. Um, so are you suggesting perhaps that the, the whole idea of priesthood that we have today needs to be turned or is that okay? Yes, and yeah, I think we should start talking about ordained ministry. Uh, the whole um, ontological chain status of, you know, the, the kind of creation of sacramental magicians, if you will, uh, and this is a, a theology of ordination that, has, that I think should go um, along with privileges and rankings and uh, 
yes. all of the stuff that has produced a highly abusive system. Yes, uh, system of supremacy. It's a system of supremacy. Yeah, exactly. And you can you could never uh, un undermine or underestimate the desire of the people who are excluded from a, a system of privilege to want to get into the system of privilege. But I would say we do a greater service when we help them analyze the system of privilege and say it shouldn't exist. There should be no system of privilege among the people of God. How does that go over with the Jesuits that you, uh, you teach? <laughs> well, I haven't discussed it with them recently, but <laughs> I, I think that I think they're quite aware, you know, that I'm not um, either wanting to be ordained or particularly concerned about, uh, you know, having our women students ordained. And we did have a panel, I think now a year, two years ago, uh, in which I was invited to participate. And I, I said, I don't think you want to hear my opinion on this subject. They said, oh, yes, we do. <laughs> so when I, when I said, you know, uh, you know, getting to ride in the front seat of the bus is not going to change anything until you change the bus system. You know, you, you could become part of the problem. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure that there are many, not just Jesuits, many ordained anywhere who think that my thought on the subject would be absolutely dangerous. I think there are other very fine ordained ministers who would agree with me. Yeah, and I the ones who are really successful, you know, effective as ministers. Thank you. I my only response to that is if somebody were to say that the Senate is a corrupt um, institution, for example, so don't, don't let women into the Senate, you know, um, because it's a, it's a supremacy even over the house, or for example, whereas my counter argument would be that, or counter proposition would be that women actually in an institution change the way or, or can change the way um, power is shared, so, but. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, but one of the things is about your comparison is that while there aren't enough women in the Senate, there's no reason why a woman can't be admitted to the Senate. Now, if the rule was that no woman could run for the Senate or be elected on the grounds that she was a woman, then I would say the same thing about the Senate that I would say about any um, organization or structure or whatever that, so in other words, I don't think you can get some good racists. Racism has got to go. Now, if you say, well, what about, uh, you know, the process of, of integrating uh, people of color into existing institutions. If that can be done, that's ideal. But if by definition, and I think that, that's what went on with the civil rights movement. It said, this system has got to go. Just getting a few black people in this position or that position, it's not gonna change anything. We have to dismantle the laws, the structures, the procedures, the whole nine yards, which is why it was such a bloody uh, affair. But no, I, I agree with you completely. If, if there's a way of changing the system from within, that would be ideal. If there isn't, then the longer we preserve it, the, 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 more, the more entrenched it becomes. So thank you, Sandra. I'm gonna, I'm gonna step in here. Um, First of all, before I, I hand it back to, to Liz, um, and Connie, I see you have a question, but I first want to just acknowledge that our next week's speaker, Catherine Vinci, is with us this cool. evening, just to kind of eavesdrop. Um, so we will look forward to a conversation with Catherine next week, all about liturgy. I know none of you have any opinions about that, right? <laughs> so, so it, it will be a good discussion next week. So I'm going to hand it back to Liz and see if we have time for Connie's question. And then we, we really need to wrap up because I was told 6.45. Stop. Yeah. 
yes, we do need, we will need to wrap up um, because we also have evening prayer tonight at seven for all souls. And, you know, if people need to jump off, um, go ahead. We could talk to you all night, Sandra. You may have to come back, maybe even come back next week and pop in <laughs> when Catherine's speaking. Um, but why don't we have one more question and, uh, and then we'll just, and we'll end it after that. I actually have a, a prayer that we can say together to close out. Um, but I'm sorry, actually, the chat is lost to me now, Anne, so I forget who you said had a question. Oh, it's Connie. 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 Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear sorry, me? Connie, yes. Yes. Okay. It's not a question. It's something to share that I grew up Catholic uh, and then I graduated from high school in 1965, the year of Vatican II. So I was inspired to join the Episcopal Church in from 1970s and 80s. And I was there when they began ordaining women. So I have to just say it was it was the most uh, just it was the most touching thing. I often think I felt like a, maybe a black person might have felt when Obama was made president. <laughs> so I I had I knew many of them and I knew a few who became bishops. I don't, I don't have any conclusions except they had to become like the men we knew and they had to run churches and it took certain administrative skills as in learning about power. But it was uh, quite an experience. So that's probably what a lot of women do now who are Catholics. I think they join the Episcopal Church. Thank you. Mm, well, I'm um, thank you for that. I'm glad, Sandra, you have not. I'm glad you're a woman who has stayed and it inspires, I know many of us, especially me, to be one of those who stay, um, the women and men who stay. So we're going to need to wrap up. And uh, I want to just, um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and if I can, um, just run through the words of uh, the, oops, sorry, of the song you heard. Um, and I, I will send this out to you. Um, but the last screen is a um, prayer for all souls. And um, we can say it together if you want to unmute. But before we do that, uh, one final thank you Sandra, for uh, joining us. It is an unbelievable privilege to be with you. And um, I know you were going to be with us in person back in March. We had to cancel at the very last minute. So I'm grateful that you came and I hope you'll join us again. Thank you so, very much. Uh, Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you. You're wonderful. I'm going to send out this to you, all of you so you'll have the words, but um, Oh, these are great. These are great pictures. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, go ahead, Sandra. How, if you have the last word, and then we'll. Well, I, I don't have any last word except to say I, I think you know what you're doing is, is wonderful, getting people of diverse backgrounds and experiences together to really talk seriously about theological and spiritual uh, uh, issues in, in the church and at a level that is not always at the beginner's level. So I, I congratulate you on the, the idea and the way it's carried out. And I'm, I'm very honored to have been invited to participate. Thank you. Good night, everybody. We may see you in a few minutes at the All Souls Evening Prayer. Join us next week and uh, we'll have another series sometime in the winter. God bless. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Julie. I don't know if you're still here. <laughs>